You may be seated. Dying, Christ destroyed our death, and rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Joseph put on Christ. So in Christ may Joseph be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves, as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. All who come to me shall not die, and all who believe in me shall live forever. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive evermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we've gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Joseph Edward Devaney. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask, and you know our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace, that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Psalm 130 is a psalm of David. 
Out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my cry. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, should mark my iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in the Lord's word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord is great mercy. With him is plenteous redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all their sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The family, uh, in lieu of a sermon, are going to witness to the life of faith of Joseph Edward Devaney, beginning with his wife, Marion, and then um, his son-in-law, Will, and then Susan, and then uh, his children will speak after that. Welcome and thank you all so much for being here. I'm here with my mom, Marion. You can see some of these pictures here. Who is the wife and lifelong love of my father, Joseph Debney. My mom had things she wanted said, and so she and I worked on a text about my dad together. She asked me to read it for her, but she's here to deliver it with me. Joey was 26 years old and Marion was 23 when they met. They were both college graduates who'd already landed the professional jobs they sought. He was an engineer, she was a teacher. Mom wants you to know how handsome Joey was, extremely handsome. She says his blue eyes were beautiful. He was beautiful in so many ways. And indeed he was. He was a very, very clean cut, six foot two, fair skinned, dark haired, blue eyed Irishman who only had eyes for Marion. They met, got engaged six months later, married one year later, and after that, for almost 62 years, she has been his shorty honey, and he is her Joey Bear. The snapshots in their earliest albums look like life of their earliest. Sorry, the snapshots in the earliest album of their life together look like a fashion shoot with two models, but the narrative is real. Mom wants you to know about Joey's amazing sense of humor and his ability to make you laugh. She just loved it. Everybody did. There was a lot of laughing from the very beginning. Marion's parents loved Joey and he loved them. The couples joined by Marion's brother, Warren, and his wife, Leela, had tons of fun with all kinds of joking, laughing, rascalish behavior and adventure. Joey was a humble man, but when he felt joy, he shared it. Marion and Joey had been trying for kids for a number of years. When they made a summer long trip to Ireland, they found out they were going to be parents. They were elated. They flew home at the end of their vacation, but took a train for the last part of the journey. As their train pulled into Alvarado Station in Albuquerque, Joey could not contain himself anymore. And when he saw Marion's parents on the platform, he put down the window and yelled out, Shorty's pregnant. <laughs> Mom wants you to know what a wonderful father Joey was. From the moment, from moment one at the hospital, he had cigars, a big green stuffed dog with a name tag that said K, loads of smiles and handshakes and dreams for the future with a new baby. They got a new car, a new house, a new daughter, and a new definition as a family. Five years later, Joey got a mini-me, 
in the shape of his new son, James Edward Devaney, who also laughed infectiously, which filled Joey with joy. When James laughed, Joey always laughed too. For years, Joey worked hard at a job he loved at Sandia Labs, but he worked equally hard at being a superb husband and father, always available to love and support. Both things were so important to him, but family was most important. Where's our mom? I've heard it said a million times. They've always wanted to be close to one another in a room. Their recliners are right next to each other. Their bedroom reflects family with a huge rogues gallery of his family on his side of the bed and her family on her side of the bed and the family they made together in the middle. It was a king size bed. Mom wants you to know how much they love to travel as a family and as a couple. We camped a lot, went to Disneyland multiple times, visited family, took everyone to Ireland for Marion and Joey's 25th anniversary, and took countless family vacations. Then they traveled as just a couple again. They returned to Hawaii and ventured to new places, the Virgin Islands, Alaska, the Mexican Riviera, Ireland, Wales, England, and the Panama Canal, among other places. And in the last five years, they got old together. They saw each other through literally painful periods of illness. I have photographed them holding each other in tough times. I have lived with mom and dad for the last five years, and most of that time I had a monitor in their room so that they could call if they needed me. Every night I heard them tell each other how much they love one another and that they would see each other first thing in the morning. Marion would stop every night and ask if she could give Joey a kiss. He would lean forward and they would meet, but Marion never stopped at one kiss. Recently, I counted 12 in a row. Not unusual. They looked at each other with that same love they had as youngsters until the day Dad died. When he did go, he was next to Mom in bed as she held him. They were the definition of what power couple should be. Their love for one another is the example for my husband and I, and we strive to replicate that incredibly high bar. In your life, your family is dealt to you, but you choose your spouse, and they made amazingly good and lasting choices. They will forever be together, Shorty Honey and Joey Bear. I will always love you, Joey Bear. Hi, um, I'm Will. I was uh, Joe was my father-in-law, and uh, he was a great Irish man. And you may be wondering why the least Irish person you'll hear from today is telling you this. The short answer is that when I fell in love with Joe's daughter almost 26 years ago, I couldn't help falling in love as well with the Irishness he'd passed on to her. So when she asked if I'd say a few words today, this is immediately what came to mind. When Kaylin and I started dating, she was already planning to return to Ireland for a year to photograph an extended project. While she was away, Joe and Marion and I chose to hang out together many evenings because we had hit it off immediately. Much of that time was spent in stories about Ireland and Joe's family and he and Marion's visits. They had become legends with the family there, even though they never said so. I learned that later. 
We laughed, we smiled, we drank tea, and I came to associate that happiness, the family around the table, with the place Irish people everywhere call home, no matter where they live. And that was my first lesson in Irishness, that it's a state of mind, an ongoing creation. There was no doubt wherever Joe Devaney was that Ireland was alive and well. If you knew him for more than a few minutes, you knew he was Irish. What's your name, he'd ask you when you met, and if it was Sean or Colleen or something similar, he'd say, that's a good Irish name, isn't it? And if it was something else, he'd ask where your family was from, and pretty soon, whatever your background, you'd be wishing you were Irish too. Joe was, a, Joe was great crack, as they say over there, meaning being with him was fun, of course, but it was also special time. He was dazzling. There were ditties and rhymes and anecdotes and songs and the occasional brogue digging for oysters with his dad, his mom's jokes, characters he'd known as a kid. He had a knack, and he used it to connect with you. He hoped to draw out your stories. Kaylin and I made many visits to both the Republic and Northern Ireland. Uh, we ended up living in Ireland for a number of years while Kaylin taught at a university, and that was when I felt like I truly connected to the place and the tempo that had produced Joe's family. In Ireland, the way to be really cool is to never blow your own horn. You could be, say, a famous daredevil motorbike racer who would listen to a fan's opinions without ever letting on who you were. I saw things like that happen. Joe was like that motorcycle racer. He had done the most amazing things, some of which you'll hear about from others here today, but he was never going to stoop to boasting. He was supremely confident in who he was. He was Irish cool. And I came to understand why Joe was so quick in conversations, because you have to be. He grew up immersed in discussions that fly like hurley matches. Joe never blinked. He could be funny or respectful or anything a situation called for in an instant. He was deft the way only Irish people can be. And he was a master of one of the least known Irish skills, quietly revealing nothing while you hoisted yourself by your own petard. I think that was part of what made the John Wayne movie The Quiet Man one of the few he ever cared to watch more than once. Kaylin had put it on for him recently, and it was one of the last things apart from his family that I really saw him dialed into. He would tell me and the young nurse who was there things about the movie. He'd been to where it was filmed in Ireland. He mentioned John Wayne, and the nurse innocently asked, who's John Wayne? Joe was aghast. He couldn't imagine anyone wouldn't know. For so many people in Ireland, John Wayne was the first thing that came to mind when you said America. And in this movie, he's the embodiment of the American dream who returns to Ireland to connect with his roots. It's easy to see why Joe identified. He had John Wayne's build and charisma. Like the quiet man, Joe let others talk all they wanted and then made up his own mind about what was right. And he was ready to back up his decisions, even if they were painful. There were so many things from Ireland that echoed in Joe, ingenuity and inventiveness, practicality and groundedness, humor. You'll hear more about those as well. But above all, what stood out to me about both Ireland and Joe Devaney was how welcoming they were, how open they were to each other's humanity. I'll share just one personal example that for me will always represent this aspect of Joe. He and I were very different people, but he always listened to me and tried to consider where I was coming from. He always wanted to hear, and most of the time he just nodded to let you know he had heard. He didn't try to one-up you or solve you. He just wanted to share life with you. When my brother was killed a few years ago, Kaylin and I were already living with Joe and Marion. The next morning, Joe insisted he and I make a point of sitting together. He didn't have a plan for what would be said, he didn't care if it might get awkward or take a long time. He didn't assume he knew the answer beforehand. He didn't promise anything. He just said, in essence, let me stand alongside you as you meet this. So we sat quietly. He was entirely present. Support and strength beamed out of him. Joe was there for me that time and countless others. And these seemingly simple acts are among the most profound things I've ever experienced, something close to sacred. And I believe this is a trait he inherited from a long tradition of firelit tables and tea and talking and depending on family. And it was something he generously gifted to whoever was open to them. 
So today I want to join in singing praises of a great Irish man that he would never have sung of himself. Joe Devaney was deeply capable but self-effacing, funny but kind, witty but reserved, strong but gentle. He was class, as they say in Ireland. He blessed those he loved with the best of the tradition that bore him, and he bravely forged new traditions. I loved him for that, and I'll never forget him because I will see him every day in my beautiful wife's smile and hear him in the jokes she is now one of the keepers of. Thank you for helping carry his spirit forward in the world. Hello, I'm Susan Miller. I'm Joe and Marion's niece. I'm not as skilled writer as my cousins, but I'd like to share a memory with you. Growing up, my family of four and the Devaney family of four, along with our grandma and grandpa Marks, spent just about every holiday and birthday together, as well as many other occasions. My brother and I and Kaylin and James had many sleepovers at each other's homes. My Uncle Joe was very intelligent, highly educated, and had a long successful career at Sandia Labs. As a youngster, I didn't know what his job entailed, but I knew it was secret and a pocket protector was necessary. For youngins, this is a pocket protector. <laughs> this pocket protector contained one or two mechanical pencils, one or two pins, a comb, and occasionally a six inch ruler, and possibly a pin flashlight. What I forgot was the two ended screwdriver. It was during one of the many cousin sleepovers that I asked Uncle Joe what he did for a living. He looked up, removed the tobacco pipe from his mouth and said, well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Everyone erupted in laughter, so I thought it was a joke. Apparently, it was top secret back then. However, I never did find out what Uncle Joe did for a living until after he retired in 1996. When my husband, Bobby, joined our family in 1988, Uncle Joe took to him like a duck to water. Bobby and Uncle Joe are former military men. Bobby and I love you, Uncle Joe, and miss you very much. I have many fond Uncle Joe memories, his laugh, his jokes, his knowledge about literally everything, and his, hi, Susie, when I saw him in person or spoke to him on the phone. Aunt Shore, do you live in Will? Can you believe it? Think of the good and happy times spent with your daddy, Bill. You will make small adjustments to your lives every day. And one day you will be able to smile when you do the thing instead of tears. I picture him dancing in Irish jigs on streets of gold. Love you, Uncle Joe.
I'm Kaylin Devney, <clears throat> and my dad taught me that that is Yakno Yenaved, spelled backwards. This is going to be really tough for me, but I'm bound and determined to get through it, so you may settle yourselves in your cushions. Be grateful you had a cup of coffee, because I'm about to hold forth on my dad. The American short story writer Raymond Carver wrote a story set in Albuquerque called What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. A group of four friends sit at a kitchen table on a summer day and have a boozy talk about love, its nature, its limitations, its possible depth, its dangers, and its potential to endure. There's no conclusion reached. How could there be? Instead, Carver creates a few very potent and challenging vignettes that question the nature of love and leave us to ponder that question. The, that Albuquerque story leaves me thinking about another story set in Albuquerque regarding the possibilities of love, and that is a story about my dad. So what do we talk about when we talk about Joe? I'm very lucky that Joe himself gave me some guidance about his nature. We sat on the patio together a lot over the last five years, and I asked him one day what the core ideas he would want me to always remember might be. He actually had an answer, which in itself is cool, if you ask me. He said, think about things, be happy, never look for the bad. So like Carver did, I would like to tell you just a few vignettes of the million stories available concerning my dad that speak to these principles and reflect aspects of him. It will never be all there is to say. It will just be what I say today. So these are eight short stories about my dad. Story one, what has that kid got to be so happy about? Joey seemed to love everything. He loved things in the moment, he loved them later. He remembered them, he told people about them. He surely couldn't have actually loved everything, but the way he focused and remembered made it seem like nothing bad had ever happened. Joey loved the day he was born, January 2nd, 1933. He was the second baby born that year. Some girl got in there ahead of him, but he still loved his cool birthday, one, two, three, three. He loved having an older brother and an older sister and a younger brother and a younger sister. It was every possible sibling type with him right in the middle of the love. He loved being Irish. But when I say it seemed like he loved everything, I mean the kid even liked chores. It was his job to get up first in the morning, walk through the cold house and down to the basement and bank the coal furnace. And he loved it. He loved the chance to get dressed alone in the big living room before anyone was up all that space and quiet. He loved waiting for the Italian garbage men to come pick up the cans and hearing them speak Italian to one another and then learning a few words before they moved on. He loved milk and he drank a lot. He loved looking like his older brother Jackie. He loved his mom, Nellie, and he loved Mrs. Bouchard's rice pudding. There was always a bowl for him. He loved his Mount Airy neighborhood and explored it every day. He lived in several different houses with his family early on, but all in Mount Airy. He loved sledding down Chew Street, the steepest street in the neighborhood, and then grabbing a car bumper for a lift back up the hill so he could sled down again. He loved delivering ice into the houses in the neighborhood for use in ice boxes. He loved selling newspapers and giving the money to his mom, who then gave him back enough for a hot, doughy, delicious soft pretzel. He loved delivering prescriptions on his bicycle all over Mount Airy. He loved riding the trolley, especially the day a lady was giving off to his friends about being too loud, and one of the other boys yelled, you tell him, pie face, you got the crust. But more than anything, he loved it when they moved to 141 Durham Street, and then bought 143 Durham Street, too. It was a long lot, 119 feet, with a two-car garage at the back, in the backyard, a maple tree, a big orange blossom bush with a pear tree on either side, a low hedge and asparagus and potatoes that his mom grew. He knew every neighbor and liked them all. Life on Durham Street was sweet and Joey was very happy. Their long lot backed up to his school, Holy Cross, and when his mother wanted him home from the playground, she opened up a back window on the house and yelled, Joseph! 
He played football with his Italian and Irish neighborhood friends on a team they called the Dago Shamrocks, not woke. Mrs. Doyle ran a small nursing home in a house at the end of the block, and there he met Mr. Ford, who he called Fordy, a resident and a World War I veteran who became a good friend. Joey was a serious Boy Scout for a long time, and he loved the outdoors and camping. He loved it so much that he talked his mother into buying two lots by Franklinville Lake in Glassboro, New Jersey, and then he built a cinder block and lumber deck and erected a safari tent. He also built a small dock into the lake. He and his younger brother Tommy would spring 40 from the nursing home, and the three would go camping there for a few days at a time. It was surrounded by pine trees, and the needles would stick on the dam and turn the water brown, so they named it Root Beer Falls. Joey also led district Boy Scout camping trips there several times during the summer. So if this was a Raymond Carver story, something would go horribly wrong now, or it would have from the very beginning. But that wouldn't be Joey's story. The roughest thing that happened to him as a child was that his parents separated and his dad didn't live with the family anymore. It was hard in the beginning, but slowly got better. There were short visits that eventually gave way to spending real time with his dad regularly. But again, Joey sought out and remembered a positive detail from those awkward early days. The powdered sugar, the varying cream, fresh donuts that they would get when they went for visits with their dad in downtown Philly. At that time, he was introduced to a lifetime love for that particular donut, and he sought out the perfect one, sampling as many as possible along the way. Story two, the 20-year-old man saved by math. He knew it was coming. How could it not be? Everyone was being drafted into the Korean War, and he was the right age, not in college, and no family of his own yet. It was a matter of time. On his 20th birthday, the letter came. He was going to be leaving Durham Street. He reported for duty and was given aptitude tests, just like everyone else. He got a perfect score on the math test, but they were suspicious, so they tested him again, this time under supervision, to prevent cheating. He aced it again. Based on his mathematical capability, he was assigned to determine trajectory for the firing of long-range guns, so he credited math with keeping from the front lines, maybe even saving his life. Later, a superior officer strongly encouraged Joe to attend university after the war, and he did. He went to Spring Garden College back in Mount Airy on the GI Bill. Near graduation, Bell Labs visited his college and selected five students from his class to offer a trip to Albuquerque and Sandia Labs with an eye towards a permanent position. Joe visited Albuquerque, and ultimately he and his friend Jack Trodden accepted positions at Sandia. They drove together from Philadelphia to Albuquerque in Joe's 1952 Studebaker. While driving through Shamrock, Texas, the hood let go and flipped up and over the windshield, and the large swan hood ornament Joe had added stuck its mighty wings into the roof of the car, pinning the hood in that position. Joe and Jack problem solved there on the side of the road. They removed the hood, turned it upside down, and jumped on it to try to flatten the acute angle. Then they secured the hood with baling wire and drove on to Albuquerque, looking slightly less like young bucks about to conquer the world in 1957 and a little more like guys who might be really, really good at math. <laughs> Story three, steel glows red at 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Joe's mom was a nurse. Joe's dad was a craftsman painter who specialized in faux finishes. For instance, he painted the wood columns at a church to look like marble. One of the ways Joey remained close to his father over the years was to work with him. Learning craftsmanship from his father and other sources too was very important to the way Joe learned and thought. He learned to really know the materials with which he was working, their capabilities and limitations, then learned to build tools that enabled him to accomplish the identified goal if necessary. He learned that repeating methods of working resulted in improved outcomes. Growing up during the Depression, Joe also learned to extemporize. He saved things, refurbished things, made things, and learned to be inventive and thrifty. Ultimately, he brought to his job at Sandia Labs a bright mathematical and mechanical mind informed by craftsmanship, interest in materials, and extemporization. The materials were obviously radically different in his new job, but he learned about them all. One of the first things my husband Will remembers about my dad was casually mentioning the burning and melting points of a metal while watching TV. 
Aluminum melts at 1,221 degrees Fahrenheit. Copper can catch fire, but is not considered to be highly flammable material. It will ignite around 1,886 Fahrenheit and melt approximately at 1,984 Fahrenheit. This makes it a relatively low fire hazard. These are the types of facts my dad knew. But at Sandia Labs, there was deeper thinking to be done. He added to his knowledge of craftsmanship and improvisation, expansive thinking, with a mind toward invention if needed. He went outside the box. He learned to create to meet needs and achieve the best possible solution. And this type of thinking kept his mind alive, active, engaged, and happy for the almost 40 years that he worked there. He had work patented, and he contributed to the making of a generator that went to the moon to power experiments, among other things. Throughout his career, he worked on projects that involved his use of math and knowledge of materials, and he was proud to do this, both to push boundaries and knowledge and to keep the nation safe. Story four, I'm going to ask that girl out for a hamburger. He saw her, she saw him. He was singing by a piano. She hoped he would come over. It was 1959. It would have to be him who came over. He came over. He introduced himself, Joe. She introduced herself, Marion, and her friend, Linda. He asked her to go out for a hamburger. She said her friend Linda would have to come too. The couple and Linda headed out. It was the beginning of the rest of his life, and it was great. For 62 years, Almost, it was great. Story five, the list never ends. When Joe Devaney had his first child, he said it was as if God had flipped a switch. Suddenly he was in the bright room of fatherhood and responsible for another person's life. His life permanently changed. He had always worked on the house, worked on the cars, been thrifty and capable, but this was a whole new ball game. He was the head of a family now. When the first baby was on the way, they bought a new car and a new house, and he started focusing on futures. He had a list of all the things that needed to be done, and one by one, he crossed things off. Repairs, plans, saving money, attention to health for everyone. He was overseeing the whole project now. When the second baby arrived, he had five plus years of fatherhood under his belt. He knew the ropes. He knew how to make a house and a child safe, and how to plan and save. It was time to start teaching skills and having fun as a bigger group. It was time to buy a camper. There had been tent camping up to that point and one night spent in the car when a bear was too close for tent comfort. It was time for serious, regular, safe outdoor fun. All that love of the outdoors needed to be rekindled and passed down and now there was another boy in the family. We camped regularly for at least 12 years in that camper, going as far west as California and as far north as Montana. Working on the 1966 GMC truck and camper he bought for us meant the list of things to do got longer again, but Dad wasn't put off by that. I recently found one of those early notebooks with lists of jobs you needed to do for the family. I showed it to him. He told me what I really needed to know was that the list never ends. You just keep finishing one thing and adding another. But Dad was never daunted by that. He just did it. When we went camping and couldn't find firewood, he just threw a rope up in a tree and pulled down dead branches. While his kids' eyes popped out at the feats their titan of a father was performing, he just figured it out and kept going so that the fun could keep going. Story six, the church of Joe. I believe that constitutionally, my dad was no fan of prepackaged thinking. He evaluated everything for himself and methodically arrived at conclusions informed by his observations and process of discovery. It was both a religious and cultural decision on the part of my grandparents to send my dad and his siblings to parochial school. It was stern for sure, but a very good education and a grounding in religion. Dad was proud of his schooling and grateful. But one day, Joey was sent home from school for asking too many questions in religion class. I believe that early experience impressed upon him the need to seek out and arrive at his own spiritual beliefs because answers were not forthcoming. My father stayed in the Catholic Church, but as an adult began drifting away. When he met my mother, they chose to be married in this Methodist church, where she had belonged since she was two years old, and he became a member. 
However, Dad's personal relationship with the Lord was paramount to the teachings of any particular church. His ideas were very clear, and he offered those ideas to his children. But he ultimately encouraged my brother and I to know the Lord in our own way, to remain open, think and feel, and to pray directly to God for guidance and support, rather than following a prescribed set of ideas about what we should do. Some of Dad's practices were definitely unorthodox. He had his non-Catholic children take communion when in the Catholic Church, as well as the Methodist Church. And the day we brought my new baby brother home, we personally baptized him. James was also christened in this Methodist Church subsequently, but first we baptized him at home with just us and the Lord. These types of irregular practices became identified in our family as following the open thinking of the Church of Joe, and we fully respect them. None of this was lazy thinking, it was just the opposite, gleaned from real consideration. The central tenets of the Church of Joe were to live in a way that pleased, pleases the Lord and that makes you proud of your actions and who you are. We were encouraged not to focus on what other people were doing, but to work on being the best people we could be. Life is so complex that just figuring out you is a big enough task. We were taught not to judge others, but to always be conscious of how we impacted them. My mother leads by example. Love and respect are all she knows. I think Dad valued that in her tremendously. Dad always prayed, and he talked to his mother all his life, too. He was private about this and did not share it, but it was consistent and important all his life. This photograph is from a series of images I made of Dad called Things That Can Save Your Life. Peanut butter crackers were one of the items that Dad felt could save your life. He often encouraged my brother and I to please just take them with us when we were heading out. The Church of Joe is a pragmatic church. Story seven, I always wanted a police dog. Joe's famous for cracking himself up, and often when he would totally crack himself up, it was so funny to him that no sound could possibly come out when he laughed. He could only squeeze his eyes shut, shake his head, and silently laugh himself silly. He had jokes and stories ready at a moment's notice. His family knows all the jokes. They've been told to us or swirled in the air around us often enough that they're part of our shared mental fabric. So eventually, the setups for the jokes became unnecessary. We all knew them. When something would come up in conversation that naturally led right into the joke, Dad would skip the setup and just shout out the punchline. This situation meant that if someone outside the family was with us, they were baffled. Suddenly, I always wanted a police dog. 47. There's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Run, Clarence. There's nothing as good as an inside joke, and the Devonies had plenty. Make that one with gas money. Joe and Kaylin, Odysseus and Achilles. My dad and I were always, always close. I'm so lucky that the love I felt from my mom and my dad and my maternal grandparents was so abundant that I never for one second doubted how much I was loved. I always knew how much mom and dad wanted me. I always knew mom and dad would do anything possible for me. I always knew they would always, always be there for me. But my dad was my champion and my hero. I had utter faith in his ability to protect, defend, and win the day, and I wanted to be just like him. Dad worked outside a lot on the weekends, probably on things from the list, and he did everything. He fixed the cars, the house, appliances, the yards, stripped, stained, and revarnished furniture, you name it. He loved it if you would come and hang out with him. Before I was old enough to really be safe doing that, though, I would be inside with Mom, and he would come in when she called him for lunch. He would eat and then rest a little bit, and then my chance would arrive. I loved to sleep in his feet. For some reason, he was fine with this and would wait until I woke up to go back out to work. So many sock naps that were so restful because you were in the lap of the invincible. I feel like I remember flying through the air a lot with Dad. He walked my feet on the ceiling. He spun me up and around like a dust devil to wind up on his shoulders, and he danced with me all the time. When I was a very small baby, he would come home from work and dance around with me singing Hang Down Your Head Tom Dooley, and I would barf on his tie. 
Later, we danced to the 70s instrumental song, Love is Blue. We played the 45 record a million times over. Sometimes it was work, sometimes fun, and sometimes battle lessons. He always made sure that I would be safe in every way, including teaching me how to defend myself verbally and physically. He advised that I say to playground bullies, hey kid, I hear your mother calling. He taught me how to throw a punch and dodge a punch, and it came in handy very early during a second grade film strip when I was forced to stand up and take care of business. But that's a story for another time. Dad taught me how to row a canoe, shoot a tin can, cast a line, do math, paint a door, carve a pumpkin with ears, think logically, tell a joke, problem solve, speak publicly, pay attention to the little things, and love unflinchingly, among a thousand other things. As I matured, he became interested in all my new interests and was part of everything I did, as was Mom. They even attended a four-hour opera in which I played second violin invisibly in the orchestra pit. That one was a stretch. In college, I attended a workshop for a hundred young photographers from across America, and I won a summer internship to a top photo agency in New York City. Mom and Dad were very proud of me, but this was the summer after the famous Central Park jogger incident in New York City in which a young woman was brutally attacked. They were scared, justifiably. Dad decided to fly with me to New York to help me find a safe place to live. We looked at many, many unacceptable places, and finally, with his help, negotiated a safe, reasonable place to live. We went to dinner after finally getting me situated, and at dinner, Dad told me he wanted me to come home instead of staying in the city for the summer. I told him that if he said that, I would come home because I was scared. But if he let me stay, I would find out if I had what it took to be far from home in a dangerous city and to make it on my own. I wanted to know that about myself. He said okay and never brought it up again. I found out later that after we parted, he drove around and around that New York City block in case I decided to change my mind, but I never came back. I think leaving me there was one of the hardest things he ever had to do, and he did it for me. He let me take a risk in order to know I could handle the big city battlefield and achieve more. It was a huge gift. That summer, I worked for a hard-nosed photo agency photographing deadline assignments and also projects about aging and one on heroin addicts living underneath the Manhattan Bridge. I felt like I found out what I needed to know about my capabilities, and I learned a lot about other people's lives and experiences, and a lot about photography, my passion. I have lived away from home off and on since 1987. In that time, my parents have come to visit me in every place I have lived. Tennessee, New York, Northern Ireland, Cleveland, Ohio, Wales, and Northern Ireland again. In Belfast, Dad and I engineered a film dryer to be used in an old armoire to dry the hundred rolls of film that Mom and I developed in the bathroom at the house where I was renting a room. What amazing parents. Did I mention they were on their vacation? When I went back to Belfast years later to teach at the Belfast School of Art, Mom, Dad, and I Skyped every night that I wasn't actually in Albuquerque for seven years. I was out in the world, and I think Dad was proud of me, but then there was trouble at home. In 2017, Dad was diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and we knew we had an actual fight on our hands. Dad raised me to be quick and determined. He was tough and ready to argue if need be, and he taught me to be the same. It's no secret that all the Devonese can yell, swear, threaten, and then sit down for a nice dinner. We're like yuppie Vikings. That toughness came into play once we decided to attempt chemo for dad at 84 years old. Will and I moved home and moved in with mom and dad. James moved back to Albuquerque from Austin, Texas with his partner, Katie. The chemo was very hard. There was a cardiac arrest in 2018 that left dad on a ventilator with limited chances. Had James not been in his hospital room to argue with the nurse that dad did not, in fact, have a DNR, and he did indeed want resuscitation, dad would have died at that time. Dad was more committed to survival and quality living than any other person I have ever met. He was off the ventilator in 18 hours and began fighting his way back. 
Mom, James, Will, and I all closed ranks around Dad, and we did all we could to be the champions for him that he was for us. He was a born fighter, and he raised fighters, and together we went to war to keep him living a good life. Five years ago to this day, Dad and I put on our blood-colored shirts and went for a transfusion at the hospital downtown when his blood counts crashed. For five years plus, Dad and the family fought with a goal of him making it to 92 years of age. He survived so many things that doctors thought he could not. He lived so much longer and so well during that time, and he and I were best buddies and big friends. It was my complete honor to be with him, and we had the kind of close time together that those sock naps used to feel like. Over the last five years, and even now, Dad has continued to support my interests. My interests have come to focus on my parents, and together we've learned a lot, experimented a lot, and made some good photographic work together too. My dad provided some of the most interesting contributions to that work about my folks and our home. As I have inventoried the house over the years, I found him and his love for us over and over in examples like all of our baby teeth saved and neatly organized on a shelf in his office. His ability and capacity for love seems unending. I told Dad about three weeks before he died, I love you so much. He said, I love you so much. And isn't it wonderful that we can love each other like this? It is utterly wonderful. So what do we talk about when we talk about Joe? Joy, appreciation, pie face, craftsmanship, extemporizing, expansive thinking, invention, family, camping, the church of Joe, punchline, staying interested, strength, backbone, dedication, devotion, and love. When you leave here today, keep thinking about Joe in all these ways, but most importantly, consider what he thought was important to focus on. Think about things, be happy, never look for the bad. So for now, I'll finish my Albuquerque story about the definitions, endurance, and expansive nature of love. But my story, nothing like Carver's, is rooted in my father's optimistic perspective. Like many, I find the wrestling nature of Carver's story addressing the struggles of love and human nature to be a harbinger and very thought-provoking. But I find my dad's story to be soul-affirming. And for me, for always, Daddy Joe will be what I talk about when I talk about love. Hi, my name is James Devaney. <laughs> my father truly did keep everything. I am wearing the suit that he married my mother in in 1960 in the small chapel in this church. <laughs> and a uh, little dry cleaning and it was good as new. And I drive that 66 GMC. The camper didn't make it. It had a leak and there was water damage, but that's, that is my truck now. And every time I'm in it, I think of him. From a young age, I knew I was lucky to have my dad for a father. It was rare amongst my group of friends to not 
to not be a child of divorce. And just as rare to have a father in the picture at all, let alone one who was as interested in actually being a dad as mine was. I remember at a young age, dad coming home from work each day was a big deal. We waited in anticipation and jumped in his arms as soon as he put his briefcase down, the briefcase with the fun-sized Snickers and peanut butter crackers stashed in it. It'll save your life. At home, he played with us, he listened, he was present. He thought about us. He made plans to travel and do things with us. He cared. He shared our Irish heritage and our family history with us. He urged us to do well in school and shared the opportunities that education had brought him. Basically, keeping him out of the infantry in the army was, was the first really big one. Um, this fell perfectly in line with my mother and her family, a family full of educators and smart, funny people. We did a lot together. We camped, we fished, we shot BB guns, accidentally shot dad with BB guns, went to Cub Scouts, built incredible Pinewood Derby cars with some engineering special sauce on them. They were far too good for a nine-year-old to have done alone. <laughs> I tried and failed at most sports, excelling only in karate, and one epic season ender basketball game where I magically made every shot I took. It never happened again. But he kept trying with me as long as I did, putting in extra time after work in the backyard. He was athletic and, unlike me, coordinated. And I always wanted to be, but it wasn't in the cards for me. On the weekends, he was always doing the list, maintaining and improving the house and cars. And I learned things like how to change a tire, replace hoses and belts, and shut down a swamp cooler for the winter. I thought every kid was learning this, but that was not the case at all. Some of my friends were able to gain this fatherly knowledge from him and appreciated it more than I did at the time. Dad and I struggled with my growing pains as a teen and a young adult. I was in love with playing music and I thought I knew everything. I wanted to live my own way and we butted heads for a number of years. We did our best with each other, but it was, wasn't always easy. Two things are important to know about this time. One, I was more often than not making very bad decisions. And two, no matter what, I always knew my dad loved me, and I him. This was never more evident than at age 26. I was suffering the consequences of my bad decisions and actions, and I finally gave up and asked for help. My family moved heaven and earth to get me the help I needed, and dad made sure of it. He made sure I was able to forge a new path. This began a new relationship for us, one where I actu was actually making reasonably good, common-sense adult decisions he could support. It's amazing how that works. I moved to Austin, played a lot of music, was able to buy a house after a few years, and every step I took, I would call him and run it by him. The caller ID would show my Texas number, and he would just answer the phone, Hello, Texas! He was always so happy to, to you know, to get that call. I tested my thinking on him because I knew dad thought things through. He wasn't paralyzed by thinking too much either. His outlook was optimistic, and I'm not saying I'm a pessimist. The glass is often half full, but sometimes it's full of existential dread and not water. Dad's thinking was always in search of a solution, not just to worry. I envy that, and I try to model it. I continued running my thoughts by him, and it got to where, more often than not, he was telling me he was proud of me, and that was truly amazing. I got married, and a few years later, I got divorced. I was afraid to tell him I wanted to do it. I had built it up in my head that he would be disappointed. He had watched us struggle and try and not find solution, and he said to me, if you are not happy, then by all means do it. It really surprised me, and it was what I needed to hear to make the next right move. He gave me permission to pursue happiness, which is what I have endeavored to do. The Church of Joe that Kaylin spoke of gave me the principles to live by and afforded me the room to be open-minded, to be a seeker, which is still what I am. It has allowed me to find the actions that fit my principles and help me develop practices to deepen and expand my spiritual journey. It has served me more than Dad could know. The idea that my faith and my relationship with a power greater than me are personal and are mine are the cornerstones I have built a life on. 
I continued to call him and run things by him, and they came and visited me in Texas a lot, and I came here a lot. And in 2017, at the suggestion of my sister that it might be time to come home to Albuquerque, my partner Katie and I moved here at the end of 2017. That was four and a half years ago, and he amazed us with his will to live many times since then. Dad truly faced a gauntlet of medical issues in the last 15 years. I mean, really, any one of them might have crushed anyone's spirit. But Dad was always up to the fight, always wanted to give it all he had to get more time. He was really grateful to be here. I'm not entirely sure what in his life experience gave him that, but it was really something to witness. I think the whole time I knew him, he was equally, in, equally engaged and happy, changing oil, traveling to places like Ireland, Hawaii, or the Panama Canal, or watching racing and football all day on a Sunday. It was all good and all worthwhile. More than a dozen times, probably, when he would end up in the hospital, I would think this will be the thing to take him out. And I was always wrong. My partner Katie started calling him Iron Man because he always rallied. He wanted to be here and was usually his optimistic self. His spirit eventually outlasted his body and mind, but he truly got the most he could out of the vessel he was given to live in in this world. He left peacefully and honestly quite beautifully without struggle, which is what I wanted for him the most and more than anyone could ask for. And I have learned to think things through, to do my best to be happy, and to look for the good, and I will miss him every day. We tune because we care.
I didn't know Joseph Edward Devaney, but I sure wish I did. That was beautiful. Thank you uh, for the witness of the way God worked in Joseph's life and the impact it had upon his family and friends. Um, I was reminded of all kinds of stories of uh, scripture and Jesus, and I, I would say there are a few things that people say about memorial services and funerals. One is, that was long. The other is, that was beautiful. And the other is, that was inspiring. This was beautiful and inspiring. And I hope that all of us um, walk out of this room and out of this day and into the days to come being inspired to be the kind of person that Joseph was described to be uh, to us and so thank you uh, for that witness and for that testimony we have a tradition in the Christian faith of affirming our faith and reminding one another what it is that kind of centers us together we have lots of differences of opinion none of us know all of the facts of what life is about but this is an idea of what most people who call themselves Christians can generally <laughs> agree upon, which is a rare thing these days to find a place of agreement. But we're going to say together uh, an old, an old, old creed called the Apostles' Creed. This is just a statement of belief. Jesus, can you put that on the screens for us so that we can share this together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The life everlasting part is what I would like to focus on if I can have just a few moments. Um, one of the heroes of faith in my life was a pastor in Lubbock, Texas. He was a, a rebel of a man who got himself into lots of really good trouble and was... Um, diagnosed with prostate cancer and eventually that led to uh, his death. It metastasized into his bones. And if you want to hear him talk, you can find a YouTube video of him called uh, An Interview with a Dying Man. His name was Ted Dots, Reverend Ted Dots. And in that interview, he says something that was profound and shapes my, my life every day and especially on occasions like this. He said that God loves us as much in our life, I mean, I'm sorry, that God loves us as much in our death as in our life. 
I think oftentimes because of the way that we function as human beings, we only know what we know, what we can see, what we can taste, what we can smell, what we can touch, the things that are around us. But there's something else. There's another part of life that comes beyond this life. And Reverend Dot said that the day that he told his grandchildren he was going to die, he said to them, do you remember your first day of kindergarten? And they were all teenagers, and they said no, and he said, I do. He said, what I really remember is the night before your first day of kindergarten, every one of you was afraid. And then you came home, and you were excited, and you crossed the threshold in life at that moment. We all fear death. But I promise right now, Joseph Devaney does not because he has experienced what the next part of life is about. And I would bet that if he could speak to us right now, he would say, do not be afraid. Live wholeheartedly, without fear, love with everything that you've got, and get ready because it gets better. In the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. God of us all, your love never ends. When all else fails, you are still God. And we pray to you for one another in our need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. Oh God, to those who doubt, give them light. And to those who are weak, give them strength. And to all of us as sinners, give us mercy. And for all who sorrow, O oh God, please give them your peace. God, keep true in us the love with which we hold one another. In all our ways, we do our best to trust you. And to you, with your church on earth and in heaven, we offer honor and glory now and forever. Amen. If you know the Lord's Prayer, would you please join with me in that now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory now and forever. Amen. Immediately following this service, you are all invited to follow uh, the funeral procession to Sunset uh, Cemetery, and it's 924 uh, Manal Boulevard, Northeast. There will be no uh, time of greeting of the family. The pandemic is kind of doing pandemic things again, and we need to try to keep everyone healthy, and the family has requested that there be no reception line. Um, but if you would like to join us at the cemetery for the committal, uh, that's also another beautiful time to be reminded of life, death, and especially of resurrection. And you can join us, join with us in that. So at this moment, time, you are dismissed. We'll let the family uh, leave first. <laughs>